this is the next to the last night. We actually got one more week after this. I kept saying one more week or two more weeks, but anyway. So I was wrong again and um, won't be the first time, won't be the last. Tonight I'm sitting down, but there's a specific reason for it. Tonight I want to try to do something uh, that I did many years ago. Uh, with, um, there is a program out called the 3D Bible Project. You can look it up on Google or, or Internet, uh, uh, Chrome, or anything like that. And this is where I'm getting a lot of this material from. Sometimes some of us, as we start trying to learn things, we see things visually, we hear things, we write things down, and I try to get my students to the best of my ability to get them to the point to where if it means writing it down, if it means whatever it is that they have to do to get to learn it, that's what I'm gonna do. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. This 3D Bible project was a project uh, put forth where you can look at it, and if you download some certain plugins and everything, you can actually look at the tabernacle as it was or as these artists render it. I think it's probably one of the best rendering that I have seen on the internet about this. And it helped me to look at it from the, from the visual viewpoint and hopefully it'll help you to see the same thing tonight. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do. I'm gonna be sharing screens. So that's part of the reason why if you're looking at this now, you see the back behind me, I've got a projector going at the same time that I'm doing this. So we're gonna to try to share the screens and uh, give you the opportunity to look at this and uh, see what your thoughts are about it. Tonight, as I said, we begin with the tabernacle, next is chapter 25, and we're going to actually go through the details of it. And I really wanna spend a lot of time trying to talk about the parallels from the tabernacle and the New Testament today. And especially, we're gonna look at Hebrews chapter seven, eight, and nine. This is gonna talk in great detail about the whole idea of the tabernacle and how it fits in under the, Christian, or under the Christian dispensation, how Jesus is the better sacrifice and the better tabernacle along that lines. Before we go any further, however, let's pray. Father, grateful unto you for the day and for the blessings you give us. I'm grateful for my students and I pray your richest blessings upon them. Please take care of them, Father, and in whatever problems and trials they're going through in their lives right now, please bless them and help them in all that they're striving and endeavoring to do. And help me, Father, to be the very best teacher that I can be. Forgive me, Father, for not doing even more preparation. Help me, Father, to do the best I can to bring honor and glory and praise to you in your name always. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so having said that, let's go ahead and share the screen. And here is, as I said, this uh, Bible project, 3dbibleproject.com, okay? And what this particular project does is two or three things. Number one, it tries to take what we find in scripture and try to put some visual representation in everything. It not only does the tabernacle, but it also does the temple and a couple of other things. And again, one of the things that's very interesting as you're looking at all of this is how these things, can you see that okay? Okay, y'all can see it okay. Can you see it on the internet, Jim? Can you see that? I can, I can. Good, okay. So here's what we're going to do. And I want to notice as we're going through here, how everything plays out is we talk about the tabernacle and again, how important it was to the Jews and how important it is to us as well. As you begin in chapter 25, he first of all starts off by asking for the offering for the sanctuary. Speak to the children of Israel. They bring me an offering from everyone who gives it. Notice willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. God has always wanted his people to give freely, willingly. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, he emphasized the ideal of the Macedonians and their giving, how they first, the Bible says, gave themselves to the Lord. So the ideal is, is these people were giving these things willingly from their heart. Now, again, a lot of people were asking, well, where did they get all this gold? Remember, again, the idea that they plundered the Egyptians when they left Egypt, so this is probably where a lot of this stuff is coming from. Now notice some of the things he's asking for. Chapter 25, verse three, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, the sweet incense, onyx stone, stones to be set in the ephod, and the breastplate. 
and let them make me a sanctuary. The word sanctuary here in the New King James Version would be better translated a sacred place, a holy place. All right. So again, that's where sometimes, especially in the King James Version, you have this phrase sanctuary, and this is where people get the sanctuary. It's the place where God is. So this would be, as I said, the holy place or the, the very special place. And then verse nine, according to all that I showed you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furnishings, so shall you make it. Now, I want you to remember this idea of the pattern, because this pattern, we often talk about in the Lord's church about pattern theology. Pattern theology is you have something in scripture that tells us what God wants and what God expects. Here in the Old Testament, he kind of begins to lay this idea down. But as we go through the reading of this tabernacle, you will see how many times he tells Moses, make sure you do it according to the pattern that you've seen on the mount. Obviously, as Moses was up there in the presence of God, he must have seen not only or heard not only that God gave him the dimensions of this tabernacle, but also the idea, he, he must have seen some pictorial representation of it somehow or another, so that he would be able to truly understand and know exactly what God wanted and what God expected. It's also interesting as you start this, and when we start looking at the tabernacle, think about it in this respect, this was the place where God dwelled among his people. Now, later, we're going to find that in 1 Kings chapter 8, 9, and 10, God is going to actually come down upon the temple. Later in Jeremiah chapter 7, he will emphasize the idea that one of the sins that the children of Israel were committing was the fact that by that time was they were saying, well, God will never destroy his temple in 586. He used the Babylonians to do just that. Um, the temple become the holy place, okay? So again, as you're thinking about this, I want you to meditate upon the fact that the tabernacle shows us up to the temple, which is also perhaps showing us the idea of the temple of God, okay, in heaven. Now think about this as well. The tabernacle was a portable tent. Again, the children of Israel had to travel, so it had to be something that portable. It had a wooden framework overlaid with gold. Every, there's gold all over this place, all right? And I just want you to keep that in mind. It's about 45 feet long. It's about 10 cubits, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. And it's divided into two specific rooms. The first room is called the holy place. And in the holy place, you have the altar of incense, the table of showbread, and the lampstand. And only the priests were allowed in this room. Only Aaron and his sons would be allowed in this room. Then you had the entrance to the holy place was a curtain that was hanging on five pillars. This curtain, as I'm going to talk to you about in just a few moments, was part of where he asked for the purple and the gold linen and so forth like that. And then the goat skin and the badger skins. He's actually going to have skins that's going to be protected by badger skins. Think about badgers. A lot of times, some people have the idea that it's not just only badger skins, but possibly some sort of a uh, a sea creature skin, and that's going to make it waterproof. Okay, so that has to be taken care of in that respect. Then you had the most holy place, and the only thing that contained in the most holy place was the call of the Ark of the Covenant. As he begins to describe this in Exodus chapter 25, he starts with what is in the most holy place. He starts talking about the Ark of the Covenant, then he goes out from there to talk about the table of the showbread. He's going to talk about the golden lampstand and then the tabernacle itself. And again, as we continue to look through this, he's also going to have, there's going to be a golden incense altar. Now, all of this comes into play later whenever you start seeing how the worship of, the, of those saints were or the and children of Israel were at that particular time. Now, um, here is the sockets. Uh, this was the area, come on, please, I'm not going to do it, okay, there was the sockets. Earlier, these sockets would all be made out of silver, and as you look at it, then what would happen is the boards would then be put into these sockets all the way around the tabernacle. 
again, every one of these boards would be covered with gold. All right. So as we look at this, we realize that not only do you have the weight of the board, but you also have the weight of the gold on this thing. So this would be pretty heavy. And that's why later in the book of Numbers, when he starts talking about them actually traveling, that the children of Israel are going to give the tribe of Levi some carts where they can actually load this stuff up and unload this stuff at a certain place whenever God says this is where we're going to stay. So this, obviously it wasn't carried by just men. The only thing that was going to be actually carried by the men at that time or the priest were, was the Ark of the Covenant itself. That's all. The rest of it's going to be gold loaded up in carts in some way or another. All righty. So you have these golden boards and there, like I said, the thing is about 15 feet high. It's going to be about, you know, uh, 45 feet long, about 15 feet wide. So think about that. And then we go to look at that a little bit further. These bars, if you look at this little thing right here, they all have bars that connect them. So you have little gold um, ingots or, or little gold clasps and you actually slide these horizontal bars through there to make it or to have it to have some sort of stability in the structure. You would have these all of these bars and silvers of gold. As we go on down a little bit further, you see the uh, west bars. Let's see. Uh, the west bars, again, you have this notice there. Uh, you have the south bars. Uh, sockets the boards the south bars the west bars which is on that back uh, the tabernacle is facing toward the east all right and that's very impressive as you think about it you go into the north bars it's got the same thing going on here we see that in that respect the inner pillars they actually had pillars on the inside as well all the way down through the tabernacle and again this was to give the stability to this in this respect um, let me see here. There was a place on here that I was trying to find a moment ago that actually emphasized the um, sockets and how they fit into the sockets. Uh, all right, but I do not see, I do not see that right now at this moment in time. So please forgive me for that. Uh, again, as I was saying this earlier, you have all of these bars, you see how they're all fit together. Then on top of it, when they would actually break this down, certain parts of the tribe of Levi would take certain parts, others would take this, only the priest, the descendants of Aaron and so forth would actually move that in. And as we talk about it in just a moment, we're going to see that there was a certain way that they took it down, a certain way they brought it back up. Now, the next thing that would go over it would be this goat skin. All right, so this is a cover with goat skin on the outside. All right, then you have a red dyed ram skin. And again, the ram skin could be sheep or goats in that particular circumstance. And then you had what you called, what he called in the, in the uh, New King James Version, badger skins. Some people again think it's seal skins of some sort. Now, seal skins are waterproof. Right? So you have to have this thing waterproof in that respect. Now, inside this most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where he describes, as he begins to describe this whole thing, he starts from the inside and works his way out. Of course, in this particular thing that we're looking up here to share with you to kind of get some, some ideal of it. So that, that's it. Now, notice he said, the Ark is, shall be made of acacia wood. We're not exactly sure what that acacia wood is. Uh, some people think it's some sort of oak or something like that. Two and a half cubits will be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. All right, so <clears throat> a cubit, and this is a very general understanding. There were different kind of lengths of measurement, like we have different lengths of measurement in our world today, right? You have meters, centimeters, uh, kilograms, so forth, and, you, and then you have the American system yards, feet, so forth. Now, a cubit at that time was, according to everything that I've read, is about the length of the tip of the middle finger down to the elbow. And on some people, that would be about eight inches. 
you would have a long cubit, which would be about 22 inches. So figuring a cubit is 18 inches. Whenever you have two and a half cubits shall be its length. So you're looking at, uh, uh, do the math, 18, 18 is 36 plus nine is what? Uh, uh, 45, there you go. So you're talking about 45 inches long, all right? A cubit and a half its width. 18, 27 inches, right? 18 plus nine is 27, right? And a cubit and a half its height. So it's gonna be 27 inches wide, 27 inches high, and how long did you say earlier? Huh? Okay, all right. So there you go. Now, all this thing is made out of acacia wood, except for the very top. The very top is called the mercy seat. Now, you notice here that it's overlaid with pure gold. Again, when you walked into the tabernacle and you weren't thinking about what all you would see is the silver down here at the bottom holding up these pillars and holding up these boards around here. But when you actually walked into the tabernacle, all you would see is gold. All right. Later, whenever Solomon builds the temple, the inside of this temple is pure gold. And we're going to read as you read through the rest of the Old Testament that some of the kings actually stripped the gold off of the temple to try to pay tribute to some of these other kings that they are having to give tribute to. So it's extremely interesting how this does come, comes into play a little bit later on. There's two poles. The two poles are holding the thing up and the Ark of the Covenant is only to be carried by the priests. All right. And specifically the descendants of Aaron. So it's extremely interesting as you look at that, that, that the only people that could actually see this Ark of the Covenant would be the priestly people, the tribe of Levi, specifically the clan of Moses and Aaron. All right. Now, he says, you shall put the poles into the rings on the Ark, that the Ark may be carried by them. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I give you. Now, the word testimony here suggests the idea of the, the Ten Commandments, the, the tables of stone. We read in other passages of Scripture, and some people have this idea, that whenever God uh, caused Moses' rod, or Aaron's rod, to bud in Numbers chapter 20 after the rebellion of Korah, as well as a cup of manna, they were to put that into the ark as well. The problem is, is none of the, you know, we read that or we think that that was three things in the ark. The Hebrew writer suggests that these things, three things were in the ark. Again, the tablets of stone, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Okay? Now, I wanted to try to keep that in mind. As you read through the text in Exodus, and again in Numbers and so forth, these other two things, Aaron's rod that buds, as well as the pot of manna, is set beside the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the Ark of the Covenant because, again, it's reminding the children of Israel of their covenant that they have made with God. And inside it, that's where it is. Now, I told you a moment ago the, about the mercy seat, all right? Now, the mercy seat is just a pure gold. It's two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half its width, all right? So it's, it's wide enough to cover that. But this, and rather than being boards covered with gold, this is made of actual gold. If <clears throat> most of us have probably um, seen or at least heard of an ingot of gold, gold is a very heavy metal. So this thing would be pretty heavy to carry. And you've got all this gold on it and around it and surrounding it in one way or another. So you'd have to get to pretty good guy, pretty good burly priest to be able to carry it. All right. Secondly, the term mercy seat. The term mercy seat comes in the Greek word. It's the word hilasterion. Now, again, I'm trying, you've taken Greek, so you know hilasterion is a neuter word. But often in the Bible, that particular word is translated propitiation which means a substitute. Now, what's very significant about this is the only time the priests were allowed to enter into the tabernacle. In other words, when God actually came down on the tabernacle, there was this cloud and they could not see in the tabernacle. And this was where 
God supposedly dwelt among his people at that particular moment in time. All right. Then when God would lift up that cloud, then they would go in, take some of the coverings, cover the ark, and get it ready to move as they're trying to break down the tabernacle. In other words, only the priests would see the Ark of the Covenant at this particular time when they were getting ready to move. But there was one time, and even that time, the priest really couldn't see inside or could not see the Ark itself, except, like I said, when they were moving it and God had moved the cloud off of the tabernacle. Whenever they had, in Leviticus chapter 16 tells us about this, it's called the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16 called the Day of Atonement. This Day of Atonement was a very religious day for the Jews. By the way, the Jews still celebrate it. It's called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Have you all ever heard of that one? You haven't? Some of you may have, some of you may have. Okay. This Yom Kippur is the ideal of when it's called the Day of Atonement. And on that Day of Atonement, the priest was to take a very thorough bath. He was supposed to put on his high priestly garments. He would go and kill two animals. One would be a bull for his sins. He would take some of the blood of that bull. And before he did this, however, he would go in to the altar of incense he would take that incense, put it on this censer, and he would, it, of course, it would start smoking, and the smell of the incense would all go through there, and it would smoke so bad that he really couldn't see it. He couldn't see the inside because God was there. That was the idea. God was there with that cloud. All right, now, we know that God cannot be made in temple made of hands, Acts chapter 17, verse 24. He does not dwell in temple made with hands. That's never one. But this was God's way of showing I am with my people right here at this moment in time. He would go in there, going back to the Yom Kippur, sprinkle, sprinkle the blood of that bull seven times with his finger eastward. In other words, so he would stand right here, maybe on this side. And if he was right-handed, he'd sprinkle the blood back, back going toward these pillars here because again, this is facing eastward. Then he would leave. He would come out. They had two goats on the Day of Atonement. One was called the sacrificial goat. The other one was called what? The scapegoat. This is where you get the idea of the scapegoat. The scapegoat would be the one, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but he would kill the sacrificial goat. He would go in there, sprinkle the blood of this eastward seven times. He had to sprinkle it seven times, okay, eastward. This was for the sins of the people. The first was for his own sins, the priest's sins, and it took the blood of a bull. The second time would be for the sins of the people. Then he would go back out. He would divest himself of all the high priestly garments. Then he would go to the scapegoat. He would confess and lay his hands on it confess the sins of the people on the scapegoat, then the scapegoat would be led off into the wilderness and set free, suggesting the idea that their sins were taken away. Now that blows our minds, right? Can you imagine being a priest at that time and making sure that you did everything right? What if you messed up? What if you got in there and accidentally went to the east or west instead of the east? You know, that, that, you have to really think things through. And I think, again, what God is trying to get across to them is that even in this situation, even though I am with you and dwelling with you as it was in the tabernacle, you cannot come before me with arrogance or pride or anything else. You have to do this and you have to do it right. Leviticus 16 really emphasizes to me, and every time I read the passage, it always emphasizes to me just how God looked at this, but it also emphasized to me, and it's, it also, and I appreciate this so much, I'm grateful that I don't have to deal with that. I'm grateful that Jesus died on the cross for me, and, and, and we don't have to kill all these now animals to, to cover our sins. The word, as I said, helasterion, is the word propitiation, and so there's that idea, the idea of the mercy seat. So here you have this Ark of the Covenant. It had two cherubim on it. Now, most of the time when we think of cherubs, we think of cute little babies. 
but cherubs at that particular time were, they looked like lions, but they had human faces. Now somebody would say, well, that sounds like idolatry to me, because, but then God saying, thou shalt not commit idolatry. You know, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Why did he put these cherubim there? Again, we don't know all the details behind all of this, but we do know that this is what God had commanded. And again, their wings are to touch one another. And all of this right here would be where the Ark of the Covenant was. He shall put the testimony in. And he says, there I will meet with you. I'm just in chapter 25, verse 22. I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the Ark of the Testimony, about everything that I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Now, we go out of the ark. The very next thing that we see is the table of showbread. The table of showbread, again, a table of acacia wood, two cubits shall be its length, so that's 36 inches, a cubit its width, 18 inches, and a, a cubit and a half its height, so it's be 27 inches, so it's going to be as tall as the ark. All right, you shall overlay it with pure gold, make an olding, molding of gold around it. You shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth all around it. And you shall make a gold molding for the frame all them around. And you shall make it for four rings of gold. And again, what they were doing here was these rings would be what the rods would go through so as to carry it. All right. And then you shall have its dishes, pans, platters, and bowls. And you shall make all of them of pure gold. Now, the table of showbread, there was supposed to be this showbread on the table, 12 loaves. And this always represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Now, when we think about it in that respect today, we can't help but think about the idea that whenever I think about the table of showbread, I'm immediately thinking about the Lord's Supper because that's, I think, prefiguring it. It's typology. It's the idea that this is the shadow. This was the real thing. And so I see that ideal of the Lord's Supper there in that respect. Now, as we go on and read through the rest of Leviticus and on into uh, uh, me, Exodus and into Leviticus, we see that this is what the children of Israel are to eat, or the, the uh, priests are to eat. They're to swap this out every week, and it's supposed to be fresh. We remember that David, the king, well, he wasn't the king at that time, but when he was fleeing from Saul, actually ate of some of this bread when he was fleeing from Saul. So it's interesting to go back and study that idea. So think about this now right here. Now, again, what will happen, you will have a veil that's in this area right here now. See what I'm saying? There's gonna be a veil. Notice also this, these, this covering here is going to be having the cherubims on it. It's purple dyed, all right? Purple dyed, and you have the cherubims all in it. Right before this will be the altar of incense. So, the altar of incense, as I said, is right there. And again, this was used. They would have to burn incense every day. But again, this would be especially used on the Day of Atonement to cover, as it was, them going into the most holy place when God is there. It's interesting that you get to the book of Revelation. That in the book of Revelation, John will write about the fact, uh, and it's it's again, sim very interesting as you read this, is the idea that a lot of what we're reading about right here is going, and, and the temple itself, is going to show itself in the book of Revelation. And there specifically in Revelation, he's going to emphasize the idea that the incense in the temple at that place in Revelation are the prayers of the saints. So he will talk about the prayers being offered up as incense before God. All right, so you have... As I said, you have the ark, the table of showbread, the lampstand. <clears throat> the lampstand. This would be set on the north side. And again, it's very important. The lampstand. The lampstand would have little bowls of oil. And again, there were certain kinds of oil that could be used. We find, as you read it very specifically in Scripture, that God will emphasize that no, and he emphasizes this in no uncertain terms, that no one, none of the children of Israel should make this oil. It's a special kind of oil for that specific purpose. Just like the incense, when they offered the incense, it had to be offered and it had to be a very special kind of incense. It wasn't just any incense would do, it, was, it had to be a special mixture. 
and God gives the recipe of what he wants and what he expects. The lampstand would be on the north side of the tabernacle. So this, here, this is where this is. So if you're looking at this a little bit closer, you see that's, that's where that is. Uh, and notice there's only seven little stands there. But that gave light to it. Again, going back to the book of Revelation, in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus is standing amongst seven lampstands. And these lampstands represent the seven churches of Asia. And when you start really thinking about this, you start thinking about the idea that the church is to be the light to the world, right? Matthew 5, 16, you are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill. The point I'm trying to make to you is even as you're looking at this tabernacle and later at the temple and then later as we come to the book of Revelation, you see that all of this has very symbolic functions all through the Bible. In the temple that Solomon built, there were actually 10 lampstands, five on each side, because this was a much bigger structure than the tabernacle would have ever been. So while the, this lampstand would give all the light that was necessary for the tabernacle, that lampstand could in no way begin to give the lamp, light for the temple. All right. Now, uh, as I said earlier, there's uh, the front door. You had pillars that was holding this up. And again, this was made of purple. All right. So again, as you're going into the front, as it was, if you want to call it the front door, you have to realize again that the only people that would be allowed in there would be the what? The priest. When we go back up to this other part here, here we have the framework. You have the table of showbread on the south, the lampstand on the north, the gold incense altar, and then the Ark of the Covenant. And all of this would have this purple, and it would have this purple veil. Now, outside in what they called the outer court, all right, you had the laver. The laver was where the priests would cleanse themselves before they actually entered the tabernacle. And again, thinking about this in a symbolic sense, the labor represents our baptism into Christ, right? Think about that for a moment. Because the only way we can ever come into the presence of God is by cleansing. And again, we can never cleanse ourselves from our sins, so we had to take what God wanted and what God expected. On the outside of the labor, there is the bronze altar, okay? This bronze altar, Okay, this bronze altar is where they killed the sacrifices. And back over here, you see this cow that's waiting to be sacrificed. All right, so that's it. And there was a ramp going up to it. They would kill it. They would take a certain amount of the blood. They would sprinkle it on the altar. And then they would sacrifice it, whether it be the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, or whatever kind of offerings they were offering, at the trespass offerings, the guilt offerings, or whatever those offerings were at that particular time, this is what they would be um, <clears throat> doing. So this is the entire structure. Now think about, again, trying to tear this down and put it back up again. There was a lot of work. You had these pillars that hold up the, the veil on the outside, and all of them would be tied down. You have the inside of it itself that, again, the priest had to cover the ark before so as to say, spare the people where they would not see this. Now, as you think about this, I want you to go now, if you would, to Hebrews. All right, go to Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9. You see, do you kind of have a better idea of the view of what the tabernacle would have looked like by looking at this? Does this kind of help a little bit? You know, and I hope that it does. I really hope that it does. And again, if you really play with your computers a little bit more, this was something that I did a few years ago that you can actually have a, if you download a virtual reality, um, there's a VT, VRTML file. If you do it, you can actually supposedly go in it and see the veils open and all that other stuff, all right? It's, 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 it's interesting. Um, but uh, you'll have to download some stuff to get that to happen. So there's where, again, what it all looks like, that's how it looks. Now go to Hebrews uh, chapter 7. He talks about the need for a new priesthood in chapter 7, verse 11. Okay? All righty. I'm going to uh, 
stop sharing now. Hold on a minute. There we go. Stop the share. All right. So glad to see you guys, all you guys. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, 11, he said, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, of necessity, there's also a change of the law. He of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. From it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Joe, Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Let me stop there for a moment. The point that the Hebrews writer is making right here is that the Levitical priesthood and the Levitical law could never bring a man to salvation. You would have to obey it, but it can never save you. And in fact, the Hebrew writer earlier in chapter 4, verse 15, will emphasize the idea, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the idea is, is that we have this high priest. These high priests under the old law, they would die. We have a prime priest that lives forever. These high priests under the old law would take the blood of a bull or a goat and sprinkle it for your sins. We have a high priest that does what? He himself shed his blood for our sins. So the point he's trying to make in the entire book of Hebrews is the idea that we're living under such a better covenant. And he brings out the fact of a need of a new covenant by pointing out that we have a new priest. And who is that new priest? It's Jesus. So and verse 14 is a very important passage when it talks about the ideal of the silence of scripture. The Lord's arose from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. Could he serve as a priest under the old law? No. Did the law have to say no tribe or no person from any other tribe could serve? No. Simply because the Bible says the tribe of Levi only, that excluded who? The other 11, right? So this is a very important principle when it comes to the idea of the silence of scripture. And then he emphasizes the idea that Jesus is this new priest after the order of Melchizedek. He says, inasmuch as he was not made a priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath said, the Lord has sworn you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there he's quoting from Psalms 110, verse four. He says, Jesus become the surety of a better covenant. What's some of the thing, good qualities about Jesus? Number one, verse 23 of Hebrews seven. There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So if you were living and you could possibly, very possibly live to see two or three high priests, or may, at least two maybe, a high priest while you were alive, right? There would have to be a change. Why? Because the other high priests would die, right? So here we have an unchangeable priest. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for us. And notice this high priest that he says about Jesus. He was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as though high priest, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he offered up himself once. So the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, but we have a new law because we are part of the son who has been perfected forever. We have, chapter 8, verse 1, such a high priest. Where is he now? Seated at the right hand of God in heaven. He's a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. It is necessary this one also have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. He just said that back in chapter 7, right? So again, he's emphasizing this. He said these goats, or the priests who offer the gifts according to the law, are a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, which Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, again, this passage is going back to Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. So you see, it wasn't just the, the, the description 
obviously Moses has some, some, some sort of vision of what this thing was to look like. All right. So Jesus is a better, what? A better high priest. So then what? If there was a better high priest, there is also a better covenant. And that's the point that he makes in the rest of chapter eight, quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 34. Then in chapter nine, look at here, here it is. Even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first, in which was the lampstand, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place, right? And behind the second veil, this was called the holiest of all, the most holy place that had the golden censer. Now notice this idea as the Hebrew writer is talking about it, the altar of incense or the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant was tied together. It was tied together as being part of the most holy place. So it seems like the deeper you got into the tabernacle, the closer you get into what? Holiness, right? The closer you get to God's holiness. Think about the idea that we are priests, right? First Peter chapter two, verse five and verse nine. We're priests of God because we are part of his blood and because he has redeemed us. So he talks about now we are giving what? We're giving our own sacrifice. And what sacrifice do we make today? Very good. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. We are offering ourselves as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God, which he says is your reasonable service, right? So you see, as we come before God, we're offering ourselves as a sacrifice. Notice he says the ark that had, in which were the golden pot. Now notice the word were, in which the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. We will also read in the book of first Samuel where the children of Israel started to attach to the Ark of the Covenant, some mystical magical quality. And whenever they went out to fight against the Philistines, I believe it's first Samuel chapter eight through 12, right in that general area. When they went out, I think it's chapter eight specifically. When they went out to fight the Philistines, they actually take the tabernacle out and the tab- and the Philistines captured the tabernacle or excuse me, capture the ark, remember? And then they were plagued, but there's a little bitty, there's just a little bitty sentence in there that's an extremely interesting sentence. Let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I'll show you the sentence there. When God, when the the Philistines sends the ark back to God's people, uh, chapter eight. Okay. I was wrong there. This is where Israel demands the King. Saul was anointed the King. Um, yes, it was earlier. First chapter, first Samuel chapter five, the Philistines had captured the ark. Chapter six, the ark is returned to Israel. Remember how that whole thing worked out. This also is a very interesting thing. Remember the old, remember what we've read earlier. Who was to carry the ark? The priest, the priest, part of the priestly family, specifically of the tribe of Aaron, right? So only the priest could carry the ark. Well, the Philistines sent the ark back in a cart carry it with a cow. Remember that? Remember reading about that? And they came to this, to Joshua, to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. This is 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. They split the word of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering. The Levites took down the ark, and which were the articles of gold. And then <clears throat> the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. And then part of this was also some of the sacrifices and some of the things, gifts, as it was the Philistines gave. Now look at verse 19. And God struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Again, remember the Old Testament, the children of Israel weren't even supposed to see the ark. It was going to be covered up every time it got moved. But now, here you have 
the people that had looked into the ark. Now, when you come back to the Hebrews chapter nine, and, it often, and again, this is my personal opinion, I'm not saying for sure, but again, as you read this very closely in Exodus as well as Leviticus and all, I don't. I think because the Hebrew writer's pointing out here, you had the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. But if you read very specifically in Exodus, only the tablets were in the ark, okay? And what was the penalty for looking at the ark or looking in the ark? They died, right? So that's pretty serious, pretty stiff stuff, any way you want to look at it. Now, he says, notice verse 6, when these things had been prepared, I'm back at Hebrews chapter 9 now, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 at verse 6, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing their services. But in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year. When was this? The Day of Atonement. Very good. In the Holy Spirit, he said he offered him uh, sins for him or offered for himself and the people's sins committed in ignorance. He says, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. But Christ came as a high, high priest. And he came with a greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but he entered with his own blood into the most holy place once for all. Now, what is the most holy place that Jesus entered here? Obviously, it was not where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was not even in the temple because he would not have been allowed to go into the temple. Where did Jesus offer his blood? In heaven itself. And you see, in essence, what happens is God says, okay, now I see my son's blood, so all that believe in him and are baptized into him are covered by his blood, and that's how he's able to save us all to the uttermost. And that's what the point of the Hebrew writer is. He emphasizes that he is in that heavenly sanctuary, he said, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus didn't have to die year after year after year after year after year. Jesus died once. It took care of our sins. If the blood of a bull and goat and the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience? So, so much was happening. The Hebrew writer brings out in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, Jesus' blood. And maybe you have heard this idea before. And we use this phrase a lot of times in the church. I cringe when I hear it because it's not, uh, it's not what we might call a, quote, scriptural cringe or, or scriptural idea. But you might have heard the idea that under the old law, God, quote, rolled their sins forward. Have you ever heard that before? That's, that's not found anywhere in scripture. In the Old Testament, there was forgiveness. Are you surprised? No, you shouldn't be. Because in the Old Testament, you will read time and time again where God forgave their sins. So there was forgiveness under the Old Testament. But the Hebrew writer brings out the idea that that was always pointing to the time when Jesus was going to shed his blood. And when Jesus shed his blood, it was a once for all sacrifice. Then where did he go after he shed his blood? He went back up into heaven itself, right? Sitting at the right hand of God, serving as a king over his kingdom. He emphasizes the idea that Jesus had to die. Verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 He's the mediator of the new covenant. I kept going back to 4.15. I'm very sorry about that. Please forgive me. It's Hebrews 9.15. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. You see, Jesus' blood not only took care of our sins under his covenant, but it took care of their sins under the first covenant. That's what the Hebrew writer clearly emphasizes to us. Secondly, 
when Jesus died, that had the force of setting what into effect? A new covenant. So you see, again, and again, think about this. When do you have, when do people read the last will and testament of somebody? After they're dead, right? So the point that he's trying to make here is that you could not know all the terms of the new covenant until the mediator of the new covenant, who would be Jesus, until he died, right? So you think about this. He says, when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats with water, sprinkled scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and his people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Now, at the end, whenever they finally get the tabernacle set up, well, actually, even before that, back in Exodus chapter 24, we actually read that whenever they committed themselves to keeping the Old Testament, that's when he sprinkled blood upon the people, right? So again, here it is. He said, this is the blood. So now we have Jesus' sacrifice, who all these other things were copies of the truth. He offered himself once at the end of the age. He's put away sin by the sacrifice for himself. He was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he shall appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And then he goes on in the 10th chapter. It emphasizes the idea of the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. There's a reminder. This is where they get the idea, verse 3 of chapter 10. This is where they get the idea of sins being brought forward, okay, or rolled forward. But here the, the Bible actually says there is a reminder of sins every year. That's a whole heap of sins, isn't it? Think about all the sins that have been committed from the time of Adam till now by every human being that's ever been on this planet. If you could just picture that ugly, sickening, horrible mass, if, if you could actually put some sort of a blob to it, you know, that is a huge amount of sins. The blood of bulls and goats could never take that away. It would take Jesus' blood. So Jesus' blood... Chapter 10, verse 5, he says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Behold, I have come in the volume of the book as it is written of me to do your will, O God. So this particular passage comes <clears throat> from Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8. So Jesus took away the first, he established the second, and his death perfected the sanctified. So what do we do? How do we live today? Imperfect obedience? Well, we can't because we're not perfect, right? We live by faith in Christ. This is where the Hebrew writer, and this is where Paul in the book of Romans emphasizes the idea of the just live by what? By faith. Another way you can interpret that and do this from the Greek is the just by faith shall live. Or the just shall live by faith. Think about that. Saying it just in two different ways, this says a lot, doesn't it? So this is the reason why and he goes on in chapter 11 that we need to make sure we're faithful. Do you see how the Hebrew writer brings out a lot of the things that was going on in the Old Testament and now makes it clear and emphasizes to us how much better we have it? I hope you do because that's what the emphasis is and that's what we're trying to do. Now, next week, this is the last class. I thought that this was the last class, but it's not. We're going to actually finish this up probably next week. It might be a very, very short 30 minute class. Hallelujah. But then you'll another have another two. By the way, how's everybody doing on my uh, midterms? Yes, no. You haven't got them yet? It is finished. Okay. Austin's finished his. Great job, brother. Great job. So let me just strongly encourage you, pretty please. <laughs> Not like you don't have enough to do, <laughs> but now I did have some people complain to me a little bit about that midterm. It was a booger, wasn't it, Austin? Okay, it is. As I've said to you before, I don't do these things with true and false and all that other stuff. About the only time I really come close to that is in introduction to Greek, okay, where I ask you to define words, right? But in this, I'm asking for short answers. 
the shorter the better. But I figured that if you write it down, if you studied it and you write it down, you'll remember it better. And that's the reason why I'm trying to get you to do that. I'll be more merciful on the final, I promise. Okay? It won't be 49 questions, it'll be 48. But anyway. <laughs> and uh, we're going to two pages. Good work. Right? I appreciate it. I want you again that 3D Bible project. You can look it up and you might be able to download it. And, and I would use it in a Bible class setting because, again, what people can see and hear that might help them a little bit more. Did this make this a lot more understandable to you? I hope so. And next week, like I said, we're going to go back and really emphasize how it all brought together, maybe about a 30-minute class, and then that'll be over. All righty. Thank you, guys.